So welcome everybody to our webinar. My name is Galen. And today you will be uh, hearing from a couple of guest speakers and we're, we're gonna be focusing on today is canopy analysis, uh, specifically using our TI-110 canopy imager. And we'll be talking about uh, outdoor greenhouse applications for disease detection, uh, citrus greening disease, um, and then also uh, a comparison between the LICOR canopy analyzer and the CID plant canopy imager. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping things to take care of. First is uh, our webinar moderator for today is Scott Trimble. So Scott will be monitoring our chat and he'll be posting relevant links uh, and making sure that people aren't having any sort of technical issues and helping people troubleshoot if they do have technical issues. So Scott is the Director of Marketing and Communications here at CID Bioscience, and he's been with the company now for three years. Um, so for housekeeping, for all questions that you guys might have, if they're pertaining to anything rel relating to the content of this webinar, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. That is how I will access uh, all of your questions and I'll be able to answer them at the end of today's webinar. If you post your questions in the chat box, I won't be able to see them and I won't be able to address those. So please refrain from using the chat function unless you're experiencing some sort of technical difficulty like a lack of sound or video. Um, and it says Susie here, but it's usually Susie's our webinar moderator, but Scott will actually be posting all the relevant links as I mentioned, since he's the web webinar moderator for today. Um, and all that extra information will be in the chat. So do monitor the chat box for relevant links, but please, if you have a question regarding any of the content within this webinar, please utilize the Q&A function. As I already mentioned, my name is Galen. Uh, I am an application scientist here at CID Bioscience. I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in food science from Michigan State University. I'm an IFT certified food scientist, and my previous experience was in managing analytical food laboratories um, and working as a food safety consultant for the produce, uh, food manufacturing, and cannabis industries. So today, our agenda looks a little bit something like this. We're gonna start off, I've already given some introductions. We'll do a little bit of uh, overview just so you have a general idea if you aren't familiar with CI-110 and the instrument and then what it does. We'll go over a little bit of that. I'll discuss uh, just a couple of applications for the instrument. And then we're gonna dive right into our guest speakers. Up first uh, is Dr. Tripti Vashisht from University of Florida. And then we have uh, coming up after that, uh, Baksad uh, Koshim Pujayev uh, from Bayer Crop Sciences. And then we'll go after that and do our Q&A session and then we'll be done with the webinar. A little bit of a company overview. Uh, we were founded in 1989. Um, CID Bioscience, uh, we have more than 30 years of experience in plant research instrumentation uh, for the research community and also for commercial needs. We really pride ourselves on creating non-destructive measurement tools that assist researchers with acquiring uh, consistent, transparent, high-quality data. Um, and our instruments are known for their ability to produce uh, instantaneous, uh, rapid, accurate results. Um, they're very durable, field-ready, portable tools. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the data transparency is always very important to us. And we are also very proud of the fact that our product line is all engineered, tested, manufactured, all under our same roof here in our headquarters at Camas, Washington, in the United States. Really brief overview. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the CI-110 already, um, but the CI-110 is a hemispherical photography instrument. Um, and so it combines that image analysis uh, to calculate the gap fraction leaf area index uh, with also uh, PAR sensors that are lining the arm of the instrument um, to calculate uh, PAR leaf area index. Um, and it uses, and uh, also it has a all-in-one uh, feature. It uses a, a touch screen that you, uh, allows you to seamlessly interface with the instrument. Um, it's a very portable, lightweight, field-ready instrument. Um, it's the only all-in-one instrument uh, for canopy analysis on the market. As far as features are concerned, uh, it is, as I mentioned, the, the most convenient factor is that it is an all-in-one unit, does not require multiple hands to use. Um, it does calculate instantaneously uh, things like your uh, average PAR, uh, your PAR LAI, your gap fraction LAI, sun flex, canopy density. Um, and a couple other parameters as well. It does uh, have GPS, an internal compass, 
And one of the most exciting things is the uh, uh, built-in filters, as well as the ability to use external filters. Um, so the filters, what they do is they help uh, basically allow you to differentiate between the sky and the canopy um, and any sort of foliage. And so you can use the filters that are built into the, that are digitally built into the instrument, but also uh, there is the ability to utilize external filters um, such as like NIR filters or other things that you would use in any other typical camera setup to help you uh, uh, differentiate between those two uh, regions that allows you to get even more accurate results. Two applications for the 110. Um, in our previous webinar for the 110, we discussed these uh, pretty in depth. Um, so there is obviously a pretty, uh, uh, there's a lot of forestry applications for management, conservation, repair. Um, there's also a lot of agricultural applications for this, looking at orchard management or field management, um, treatment efficacies, uh, looking at disease. Uh, we're going to hear about that here in a second. Um, and then there's also ecology applications, looking at plant biodiversity, distribution, and biomass. Uh, and then we even have users that are using it for kind of non-traditional applications like urban planning and development or architecture or civil engineering uh, applications. So there's a wide variety of uses for this instrument. Um, and it's a very open-ended instrument. So today we're going to start off with our first guest speaker, Dr. Tripti Vashish. She's uh, from the University of Florida. She's an assistant professor and citrus extension specialist. Um, she's at the Citrus Research and Education Center at the University of Florida. And her research focuses on citrus production, strategies to improve fruit quality, especially, especially under the HLB prevalent conditions. Um, she is widely published, so more than 25 scientific articles and book chapters. 50 plus extension articles, um, over 60 conference proceedings and abstracts. Uh, she's also the co-editor of the Florida Citrus Production Guide, and she is conducting a number of statewide trials on citrus uh, nutrition and horticultural practices to rehabilitate HLB affected trees. So very interesting research. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, uh, Tripti, and then you can actually take over and share your slides. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, afternoon. It's getting close to afternoon here in East Coast time zone. So anyways, um, so in my today's presentation, I'm going to talk about how being able to assess canopy density is becoming effective in assessing tree health, uh, especially for citrus. And um, citrus in Florida is struggling with a disease called Wong Long Bing or citrus green. I'll briefly touch upon that. And um, uh, how we are finding just canopy density is one of the most effective tools. Uh, I will have to say uh, LAI uh, Analyzer was one of the first equipments that I bought from my startup fund and it was a well spent money and you will see how. The work that I'm presenting is uh, mostly done in my lab and then with our plant pathologist here, Dr. Amit Levy. So about um, myself first, I am an assistant professor at University of Florida. Here is the map of uh, Florida and the, all the circle numbers are where University of Florida or campuses are. Uh, and the one in this yellow circle, number one, that's where I am located, it's Citrus Research and Education Center. CREC, Citrus Research and Education Center, was established in 1970. So we just celebrated our 100th year anniversary. Originally, it was named as Citrus Experiment Station. And this is one of the world's largest uh, research center that is dedicated to one crop. So we have about 300 people here, and everybody pretty much works on citrus. Here is the website of CREC in case if you are interested to learn more about our efforts and what's happening here. About myself, like I said, I'm an assistant professor in horticultural sciences. I've been working since 2014 here at UF in this position. And my job is to support citrus industry through research and outreach. My research efforts are focused into nutrition, growth management, citrus flowering and fruit physiology. And then my extension efforts, which basically means that uh, communicating our research to our growers. I am doing various stuff there. Um, one of the, some of the prominent things are citrus production guide. And then I 
also organize number of seminars, publications. So the type of work I do is very applied. It has to be something that can be immediately adopted by the growers. Right now, our uh, industry is struggling with HLB, citrus greening. So most of my research efforts are focused on HLB. Uh, before I get into the, my research, uh, citrus production in US, there are four main states that produce citrus, Florida, Texas, California, and Arizona. Florida is primarily sweet orange, California mandarins and grapefruit is uh, in Texas, Arizona is uh, lemons mostly. Overall, the citrus production is decreasing in, um, in United States. Here, this is a graph taken from USDA. You can see from 2000 to 2019, about 20 years, we are steadily declining in production. And same thing is happening in Florida. So whatever you see for United States, the same thing is happening in Florida. Florida citrus industry, Florida has the largest sweet orange um, industry in United States. Earlier, we were the largest citrus producer in the United States. And since in last few years, we have become just the largest producer of sweet orange. Our production is declining. But overall, we are a $9 billion industry, employs about 80,000 people. Our production has decreased by 70%. And this is mostly because of the disease Huang Longbing. In this map, uh, all the colored counties are the ones that produce citrus, and this star is where CREC or where I'm located. So we are pretty much in the middle of the citrus producing region. So citrus industry and HLB. Um, HLB was first found in 2005 in Florida, and here is another map um, of Florida. And now what you're seeing here is uh, all these colored counties are the ones that were detected with HLB by 2009. So within four years, pretty much the entire state uh, was affected by uh, HLB. Currently, we have close to 100% infection within Florida. So there are no more health. Well, there might be some healthy trees, but they, they are not many, and it's difficult to find any healthy trees right now. Maybe some new plantings are healthy. And sweet orange, which is the main crop produced in Florida, and grapefruit, both are highly susceptible to HLB. HLB is caused uh, by, a it's a bacterial disease, uh, Candidatus libertibacter. So it's a bacterial disease, it's a systemic disease. And it is spread by an insect vector, psyllid. So here you see, this is the psyllid. It feeds on the young leaves. And when it feeds, it transmits the bacteria or it can acquire the bacteria from an infected trees. This bacteria, Candidatus libertibacter, is for phloem limited. So it is found in the phloem. And it's very highly um, unevenly distributed within the tree and uh, that's a concern. Some of the characteristics of HLB are shoot dieback, uh, leaf shows blotchy model, poor quality of fruit, root dieback, pre-harvest drop. So you can see these are some of my experimental trees and you can see lots of dieback on these. I'm sorry, my mouse is kind of all over the place. Um, and you can see the fruit on the ground. To give you a comparison, uh, this is how a healthy tree looks like. This photograph, uh, it's the same variety in both the photographs, Valencia, which is a sweet orange. The healthy looking tree, that's a photograph from California. And the other one is in Florida, my experimental growth. So um, before I get into my research briefly, um, so, what we do understand about HLB that you have a healthy tree and uh, this tree um, under normal circumstances produces carbohydrate through photosynthesis since these carbohydrates to the fruit and the root and any other sink tissue. Um, and sorry, this 
Insect vector, Asian citrus psyllid, feeds on the leaves, transmits the bacteria. This bacteria thrives in the phloem. Phloem plugging starts happening, which kind of interrupts the translocation of the carbohydrates. We start seeing root loss, water and mineral uptake reduces, fruit quality lowers, fruit drop is seen, and the tree decline happens. Currently, there is no resistant germplasm to HLB, and also there is no cure for HLB. Some of the things that have been explored are vector control, so in use of insecticides to control that psyllid that transmits the bacteria. And then there are several management practices that have potential, like enhanced mineral nutrition, antimicrobial peptides, and plant growth regulator. But in order to find the effective treatment, precise and accurate evaluation of treatments is required. So to be able to say, yes, this treatment is working, um, we need to do that. The current evaluation uh, consists of CLAS, the bacterial titer determination. So what we do for that is we collect the plant tissue, extract DNA from that tissue, and then we run a PCR reaction and then we look for the bacterial DNA basically, and we report the CT value. Generally the CT value, a PCR will give you that. And higher the value means lower the bacterial titer. So that is one of the most common ways how we are determining the bacteria in the trees and how most of these treatments, say antimicrobials or peptide treatments, look into whether they are being effective or not. Now there are concerns about CLAS determination by PCR. One is this is a paper published by my colleagues and they said that CLAS remains detectable even for after, even when you kill the bacteria, it stays in the system, in the plant system for almost five months. So that's a concern. Your treatment might be effective, but this back DNA will stay in, your, in the plant's system. Another issue is that CLAS is unevenly distributed in the plants. So think about a big tree. We pick say 20 trees for the CLAS titer determination. Not all 20 trees are going, not all 20 leaves are going to have the same amount of bacteria in them. So the sampling can affect your results. Also, uh, there might be uh, seasonal influence on the sea less titer when you have a lot of growth happening on the tree there might be less bacteria just because of the dilution effect so that's a concern concern and then also lower sea less always doesn't mean that the tree is performing well and for that i want to show you this photo uh, this image um, this is a plot that shows the ct value for the bacteria and in this, my colleagues had looked at the CT value in these different plants for almost three years, and they were just reporting the CT value. In their overall analysis, they found this sugar bell and tango to be highly tolerant to HLB. But if you look at their CT values, it's all over the place. It's not obvious that, say, if it was that it is staying on the top. It's all over the place, and that's a problem that uh, sea less doesn't mean, uh, lower titer doesn't mean necessarily that the tree is performing well. Also, uh, work done by one, my another colleague who is my co-author in this work, Dr. Levy, they looked at the tissues, different tissues. So let's see in this first micrograph, this is the leaf. And here they saw a lot of the plugging of the phloem but they did not see any CLAS bacteria uh, cells in this micrograph. When they looked into the root, they saw CLAS. This is the CLAS, but there was no plugging happening. And then they looked into the seed where there is high amount of CLAS, so lots of CLAS bacteria, um, lots of bacteria, but no plugging. So micro Scopic analysis definitely can show you the bacteria, but again, it depends on the tissue that you're looking at and uh, you may not find what you're trying to see. So plant response is not directly related to the number of bacteria in the tissue. 
and maybe plant response is more important than the bacterial level. So if flow unplugging is an issue, maybe that's an important aspect than actually counting the bacteria. So how to evaluate the treatments effectively? We don't have any healthy trees to compare. That's one thing that complicates. But overall, yield. Yield is the most important parameter from a grower standpoint. If your yield is improving, you can say your treatments are doing well. Problem with eel is that it can be done only once a year. It's very laborious. And sometimes treatments like nutritionals um, that I work with usually, they can take more than a year to influence the eel. Also think about that if you start your treatment when your crop is already on the tree, you may not see the influence. Uh, so you really have to time well. Another um, important factor is fruit detachment force, which indicates the fruit drop. Uh, potential. So if the fruit is coming off detaching easily, that means there is more likely a fruit drop, which will reduce your yield. But similar to the yield, even fruit detachment force can be just measured once. So in order to find what can we do, we evaluated about 30 trees in three different orchards. And we tried to see how the yield collaborates with or the, how the yield is related to less titer, canopy volume, canopy density. And for canopy density, we'll be reporting leaf area index and power interception, root density, leaf chlorophyll level, disease index rating, which is a very subjective method. A person just goes and says, what's the rating for the disease? And then the fruit detachment force. This is a correlation table that um, we found and uh, here, there are um, all the different parameters that we measured, and we, we found that the yield is related to canopy volume, power interceptions, so canopy density, and fruit detachment force. Also, when we looked into the fruit detachment force, we found it is related to disease index, root density, leaf area index, and power interception, and very significant. This relationship is very, very significant. And overall leaf area index and power interception, um, they are related to number of parameters. So all together, all of these correlation plots showed that um, power and leaf area index is our best way to um, estimate tree yield and the fruit drop that it may have. Also root density, for example, root density is really difficult to measure because it's underground and um, by measuring the canopy, you can assess what the root density will look like. So here is another table which is showing you, um, we have these three different orchards that we used and then the HLB symptoms. So the trees were divided as severe symptoms and mild symptoms. And what we found is again, when you look at the power interception, these are clear differences. Mild has a higher power interception means higher canopy density and that also related to the yield of the tree. Um, but when we look at the CLAS tissue, uh, CLAS in the plant tissue, there is no difference. So canopy density is a better parameter for assessing a tree's health than actually measuring the bacteria itself. We just don't see those differences um, here. Um, and uh, this is here we are reporting not the CT value, but actually the actual number of cells. Uh, so canopy density here again, uh, now there's a picture. Here is a mildly symptomatic tree with a leaf area index of 2.15 and a power interception of 95%. And there is a severe tree with a LAI of 1.8 and a power interception of 75%. So you can see the differences. So HLB causes a lot of leaf drop and shoot dieback. So measuring leaf density is more reliable. And we have a number of um, data points to show that the higher the canopy density, higher is the yield, though CLS is not uh, related to that. How to measure canopy density? Um, Canopy density can be measured as leaf area index and PAR, and Galen did talk about LAI and PAR earlier in this presentation. 
and um, basically the fairy index just tells you how many leaves are over a particular area of ground and then the bar is how much light is getting in the canopy. This is an older version of uh, canopy analyzer that I used, a uh, plant canopy imager, and that's what I had bought seven years ago. It has been very helpful for our research and we are still using it. So sorry, I don't have the newer version photograph, Galen. Um, but so this is how we do it. This is my technician. She's the one who has been doing most of this work for me in the field. We have a tree and then we put this instrument and in, try to get to the middle of the tree. We can see on the tablet how the image is looking. And basically right there, it gives us uh, uh, LAI and all these different parameters, sun flag, LAI, PAR. Um, so we get all of these measurements. Then when we sometime when depending on the tree itself, we want to come back to the lab and look at these images again and try to take out any trunks. If there are major scaffolds, we can do that. So it allows you to eliminate anything that you may think might not be a leaf to get a better accurate measurement. Here is another image. So this is what the fisheye lens looks. And so in this case, what I'm trying to show you is that this is one of the trees pre-treatment that we used. And the canopy volume was 6.8 meter cube in this case, and the LAI was 3.0. We applied a heat treatment, which caused a lot of defoliation. Our canopy volume was still the same because it only caused leaf drop and our LAI was reduced significantly. And you can see the difference that, how much difference is between the two. So LAI is a better measure uh, parameter uh, for us in measuring this. And also we have been focusing on PAR interception in addition to LAI because uh, PAR, how we measure PAR first is that we just measure the PAR values because this LAI canopy analyzer has a light stick light sensor stick so it gives you, us the power value over an area and we measure the power values inside and outside and then that can give us a percent interception of light happening we take about four measurements per tree to get a better representation for a huge a citrus tree and when we calculate power interception percentage, we are able to do it any time of the day. Otherwise, we prefer LAI is preferred to be done on a, a sunny day for the best measurements. So altogether, what we are learning is that the canopy density is the best measurement for assessing tree health, uh, especially for HLB affected trees. Bacterial titer is not related to tree productivity, canopy density is so investing in canopy is beneficial and being able to quantitatively measure canopy is essential for assessing treatments and that's how uh, how we are assessing hlb treatments is reshaping now and canopy density is becoming an important aspect with that i'd like to thank everybody and these are my three people from my lab who have done all of this work so thank you um, i'll be happy to take any questions if you have Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Vashish. Um, it doesn't look like we have, looks like we have one open question. And I think you answered this one and it was, what is HLB? So I would think that after that presentation, um, that was a pretty uh, significant uh, uh, answer right there. But uh, the next um, question really quick for you before you take off is, how do you take a quarter of a tree, take an image of a quarter of a tree that some sky is there, right? That's the question for you. So you said you two, you usually do four measurements per tree. So they're asking how you, what your kind of procedure is for taking an image of a quarter of a tree. So basically uh, we try to get to the each. So we see a tree and try to assess, think it like there are four quarters, it's a round canopy. And then we take the measurement in each quarter. It's it's very imaginary. There are no clear quarters. I think I'm understanding the question right. Yeah, I think they're just kind of curious about uh, and making the, sure the, that it, yeah. Why we take quarters is that or take four measurements on the tree is because 
canopy thinning, uh, it could be very sectored. Uh, canopy thinning is very sectored, not the whole, not always the whole tree will show all the defoliation. Only one section may have. And if I take just one measurement with these huge citrus trees, we may, we may actually overlook something. So that's why we are taking four measurements. Great. Um, and then another quick question for you before you take off is, what is the best time of the year to measure density? So it really depends. I think um, what we have been seeing is fall and winter would be a good time for citrus in this particular case, because we know there is some natural defoliation that happens uh, during that time. So you will be able to better differentiate between a good tree and a bad tree. But to be very honest, actually, you can par interception the way we have been doing. You can measure LAIO par interception throughout the tree if you you have you are comparing it because it's a comparison. You know. Yep, uh, makes sense. I just realized my video was off. Sorry about that. Uh, um, and then one one more really quick question is they're asking, um, did you or how did you assess your root density? For your that study that you were so root density assessment is very tedious uh, you have to take number of soil cores from the ground uh, so in this case we take about eight soil cores then we sieve out the roots and the dirt separate it out then we measure the root and then we give it a cubic meter square because we know what the soil core volume is and then we know how much root are in that uh, it's very tedious and also since you don't see where the root system is, there are good chances of missing out on something. And, yeah. and I will say, if anyone's interested in root studies with HLB, uh, you can look at Dr. Yukopo Rossi's uh, work that he's done with our CI602 root imager, um, which we have done. Uh, I've done an interview with him as well as another webinar I had previously. So, um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Rashish. Um, we're going to move on with our presentation. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by and sharing your work with us. We really appreciate it. All right, so now I will jump back into our presentation here and we're going to have one more guest speaker with us. There we go. So uh, up next, we have uh, Bexad uh, Hoshi. Oh, sorry, Bexad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher your last name again. I think it's Hoshim, oh. <laughs> Hoshim Hujayev, right? Pretty good, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Bexad, for joining us today. Uh, Bexad's going to discuss uh, his work. Uh, he's just going to kind of uh, discuss uh, what he's done previously. Uh, he actually has a very uh, unique situation in that he has experience utilizing both the CI-110 plant canopy imager and Lycor's um, plant uh, uh, canopy analyzer. So um, Bexad, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? You have a lot of information here that you can uh, share with us about your previous experience, and then also um, talk about you know how you've utilized the instruments, your study that you you did uh, comparing the two instruments, and then tell us a little bit about your experience uh, with what you think um, anecdotally about you know how you feel about the CI one hundred and ten uh, versus the light core instrument. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Galen, for the introduction and thank you for um, inviting me for this um, uh, um, webinar. Um, I will not be able to uh, go deep as uh, uh, uh research um, due to time uh, constraints, but I would be more than happy to share uh, my experience with these this two in instruments. As Galen mentioned, it's a very unique um, how can I say situation uh, in our case, because uh, most uh, the plant canopy analyzers are developed for taking measurements in outside conditions in outside setups like forests, uh, vineyards, open field, uh, field crops, vegetable crops. In our case, well, it was um, the measuring the LAI in greenhouse conditions in indoor conditions. And uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the before I move forward, just like I, would, I would like to give a brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm a, my name is Birsad, as was mentioned, and I'm a currently a seed technology operations specialist at Bear Crop Science um, in Cal here in California. And before that, I was part of um, uh, 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 the Syngenta. 
And before that, I uh, spent uh, almost six and a half years in South Korea as a postdoctoral research associate as a protected horticulture, horticulture research institute. So, um, what and the, as um, the LAI basically is a very important growth uh, parameter uh, for green uh, green plants, and it's highly correlates with other. Uh, parameters, growth parameters like biomass, and that's why we want to um, um, incorporate incorporate L uh, LAI in our uh, research results. So, um, as you know, that um, uh, traditional LAI measurement methods are extremely uh, time-consuming, labor-intensive, and in sometimes it's not attainable. For example, in forest environment, it's uh, extremely difficult to do the destructive sampling to get the actual LAI measurements. And in our greenhouse, uh, where, where, where we have a limited um, trial space, we don't want to remove all plants just to uh, learn about LAI. So we want to find something um, which will help us to measure measure the or estimate the LAI uh, quickly uh, at the same time ac accurately right without um, destroying uh, the pl de destroying plants so we had a uh, LAI 2000 which is manufactured by Lycor um, and this instrument is um, very um, in, uh, extensively reported by uh, various researchers and uh, it utilizes very um, scientifically proven uh, method the gap fraction method to estimate LAI so uh, unfortunately I was not able to find the research report previously uh, published research reports on uh, greenhouse LAI measurements so I communicated with to manufacturers to get the input, uh, to get the tips, uh, tricks, um, um, experiences. Uh, and based on these experiences, uh, based on the manufacturer's input, as well as our own observations, uh, we, uh, the main objective of our uh, the trial was to develop a very specific um, um, sampling technique uh, in, for greenhouse crops. And the uh, the specific when I say specific because in greenhouse we we, uh, we don't have a uh, um, the sky conditions are how can I say abstracted with with um, different greenhouse uh, f frames right so it will uh, interfere with the uh, LAI results so that's why we wanna how can I say minimize the effect of greenhouse uh, construction um, parts or the plant supporting parts and um, uh, and get at the same time get the uh, true uh, the uh, the accurate LAI measurements. So uh, what we did is uh, first we started with LAI um, uh, 2000, uh, which is crop um, uh, the canopy analyzer, and uh, uh, to uh, how can I say develop the model uh, or protocol for to taking measurements with this instrument. Uh, the all uh, LAI measurements was followed by destructive sampling of our, our, our of our greenhouse plants. Um, so at the end, uh, we found that with a proper uh, measurement technique, uh, uh, it's still possible to get accurate LAI measurements even uh, in a greenhouse in, in indoor environment, right? So it was um, uh, we we published uh, excuse me we presented our result uh, results in a, uh, one of our uh, Korean uh, one of symposium of Korean Society of Agriculture Science, and uh, in two thousand. Um, 16, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we wanna in, uh, the use LAI for our crop uh, growth models, and we wanna find something. Um, how can I say? Uh, who uh, we wanna find some uh, instrument which will allow us to continuously measure uh, the LAI in greenhouse environment. So my colleague, Dr. Um, Dr. Kyungsun Park, he acquired the uh, CI 110 and asked me to support the, with the, sam uh, the sampling um, um, and measure, taking measurements in a greenhouse environment. So uh, during the uh, summer growing season in greenhouse, we take measurements in tomatoes and in and, 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 um, and, uh, sweet pepper in a greenhouse environment. Uh, it was a well-known type in greenhouse, greenhouse covered with glass. Um, and uh, so the we use both LAI 2000 and uh, CI 110 and, 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 and followed by the destructive uh, sampling. And uh, 
uh, both instruments are produced very, um, how can I say, uh, very reliable result, very close to actual uh, actual LAI results. At the, the, when we did the regression analysis, uh, the R square was higher than 98. Uh, both instruments over or estimated slightly overestimated uh, LAI um, uh, the results, but I think it's because of uh, different construction elements and other uh, uh, and, uh, factors which uh, interfered our result. But overall, the overall the result was uh, highly uh, the, uh, correlated, and uh, it was a linear relationship. So, uh, and we've uh, concluded that with the appropriate um, the model, uh, we can uh, still uh, collect the, the collect the, uh, the accurate LAI results even in greenhouse conditions. So, uh, if uh, uh, one of the main uh, how can it drawbacks of the LA, LAI 2000, it's um, it's uh, uh, it's, it requires specific uh, light conditions, right? Uh, you you want you may want to have a very uniform sky conditions. Sky conditions. Ideally, it's an overcast day or highly cloudy day where you have a, a good portion of the high portion of the diffuse light, right? However, under a uh, clear day, uh, your um, due to uh, high portion of direct light, uh, your uh, LAI measurements with a LAI 2000 plant canopy analyzer may be highly under underestimated. So uh, that was the main issue. So to overcome this issue, we had to come early morning, uh, just before sun. And sunrise, or in the afternoon, the late afternoon, just before the sunset, or uh, uh, we have to wait um, the uh, clear, uh, excuse me, the overcast day, right? And uh, that was the main uh, issue associated with uh, uh, this canopy analyzer. But uh, with the CI 110, uh, it's uh, it does not require the specific light conditions, right? And it it uh, say. Um, main difference between uh, between two instruments. With LAI 2000 plant canopy and an analyzer, you have to take two measurements, above canopy measurements and below canopy measurement. And based on these measurements, instrument uh, instruments integrated a computer will calculate LAI utilizing the gap uh, fraction method. With uh, CI uh, 110, it's um, uh, Basically, it's a, uh, it has a camera, high resolution camera, right? And uh, it utilizes uh, the image analysis. So it doesn't require the uh, specific sky, sky condition. We can take measurements of an um, overcast day, uh, high, cloudy day, um, the sunny day, or even, you know, in, in a mixed day. So that was a really um, a good thing about the instrument. Also, um, I take notes here. Um, the, the CI-110 has a self-leveling lens, which again, really help taking measurements in a, you know, in a greenhouse environment. So you don't need to wait until you have, um, you, you, you have a, a nice leveling. Although the LAI-2000 LAI has a level uh, on, a, on a sensor head, uh, again, it's difficult to get the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate level during, uh, during the measurements. Another thing is a good thing, you can see the image, right, when using the CI, to, and you can avoid, um, how can I say, um, some um, interference from the uh, greenhouse frame. So the, 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 the one thing I noticed that, however, it was uh, the best results uh, we can get uh, on a very clear day because uh, and, uh, due to reflection, uh, that when the sunlight strikes the, um, strikes the greenhouse frame, it uh, looks much lighter than the canopy, uh, than leaves. So it will be much easier uh, um, when we use thresholding to separate leaves from the uh, other greenhouse parts, right? Because greenhouse leaves will uh, look more um, darker than the greenhouse uh, frame. So it will be easier to separate these two and get the more uh, accurate LAI measurements. So that was a, a brief, um, uh, my uh, trial results. Um, yeah, uh, if there are any question, I would be more than happy to answer. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you, Bexad. Uh, so we'll go ahead and answer questions here at the end of the session. I, I'll just wrap this uh, rest of the webinar up and then we'll kind of dive into um, some more of the questions that people might have. But great information about um, the use of both those instruments in greenhouse settings. Uh, so some if other people on this webinar are looking to do greenhouse studies. It sounds like if you have a glass uh, greenhouse, you should probably be doing it on a clear day to have the best possible differentiation between your canopy and your um, uh, and your actual greenhouse structure. So um, some great insights. Thank you, Bexad. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll just kind of wrap up the rest of the webinar and then we'll address whatever questions might still be uh, uh, present on the uh, human eye feature of Zoom. So uh, just to kind of summarize what we've talked about today, there's lots of applications and use cases for this 110. We've heard about using it as a tool to assess uh, um, effectiveness of treatments for HLB in citrus uh, plants down in Florida. We've heard about it being used in greenhouse studies. Uh, so we've heard about it in the field, in the greenhouse. Um, so it's not just an instrument for say forestry, uh, but it can be applied to all sorts of other agricultural and ecological practices as well. Um, and so lots of researchers can benefit from this instrument. Um, as you can see, uh, both of our researchers today, we're utilizing an, an older format of our instrument that actually uh, has a, it's a two-handed format. We've updated the instrument since, as you can see in this photo, it is now a singular instrument. Um, uh, and so it's even more convenient to use, still utilizes the same hemispherical photography, the leveling camera, um, and you can still see your image as you take it. It's just a more convenient form factor now, um, and it's a very lightweight structure, so it's easy to take out in the field and, and use for long periods of time. Um, and it does give you those fast, reliable measurements, the LAI and the PAR, the canopy density. Um, you can adjust all of that uh, uh, with filters to make sure that you're getting the most uh, differentiation you can between your canopy and your uh, uh, sky, even on the weirdest of lighting condition days, you can use it on super cloudy days, as uh, Baghdad said, or you can use it on, um, you know, very sunny days. You can also, if you're having issues, you can use actual physical filters. So one thing we've been looking into recently is NIR filters um, for the actual camera and the lens of the camera. And it's a really easy thing to do that yeah, you can just pop off the camera lens, put a filter in there. Um, put it back on and that actually it really helps differentiate between the living plant tissue and any sort of sky or structures above um, so that's something else that you could look into um, if you're looking at uh, more difficult situations with uh, trying to uh, differentiate between your canopy and your sky um, uh, and so for obviously if you guys have any questions um, you can always reach out to myself or the our other application scientist, Eric Munoz. Um, you can also get connected to us on our social media pages. You can email us at any time, sales at cid-inc.com. You can give us a phone call. You can um, visit our website, which is one of the best places to get updates on what we're working on currently, new projects. You can sign up for our newsletter and our blog updates. Um, you can see those on our website as well. You can also get in touch with us on LinkedIn. Um, due to the pandemic, uh, I would normally invite anyone who wants to come uh, visit us, uh, to come visit us at our headquarters. Um, however, for now, we're kind of uh, we're probably uh, not really encouraging that as of yet. Um, so moving on, we'll actually start our question and answer session. If you would like a quote for the instrument, uh, please, and if you want more information on it, please feel free to click the uh, tiny URL link that Scott is gonna post in the chat. Um, that will take you to a page that will allow you to get a, a, a quote and to get some more information on the instrument. Um, if you uh, would like a consultation with an application scientist, myself or Eric Munoz, then uh, please feel free to click the Outlook uh, uh, link. That'll take you to the Bookings website, which will allow you to book uh, a time to do a consultation with myself or uh, Eric Munoz. If you're not certain if the instrument's gonna work for your specific application or any kind of questions regarding that, uh, feel free to book that consultation. It's a free consultation. Um, and uh, we wanna make sure that the instrument is the right fit for you and your research. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the Q&A feature and we are going to address the questions as they came in and we'll start with this question um so uh 
we actually already heard this answer from uh, Dr. Vashish. Uh, it's what is the best time of year to measure um, density. This is for the HLB affected trees. Um, and due to the, uh, the nature of the instrument of the 110, the CI-110, uh, it allows you to take density measurements at any time under any conditions. So really you can do it um, uh, as often as you would like and it would, and it's more useful to collect more data over longer periods of time. So, and it's very, since it's very easy to do, uh, that's um, a, a really big benefit to that method as opposed to the classical method. The next question is from uh, Jesper. It's how do you subtract the 100% sky part in the image? Um, so this is in reference to that question about uh, uh, Dr. Vashish, uh, their methodology for taking uh, basically four measurements per tree. So four different quadrants of the tree. Um, so actually uh, the there is a feature on the tablet and, or on the built-in tablet on the instrument, or if you have the two-handed instrument, it's just the separate tablet. Um, so what you can do is you can actually specify which regions um, you actually want to include in your calculations and which regions you don't want to include. So you can include or exclude whatever regions have parts that don't have any canopy. So if you have a whole quarter section of your image that doesn't have any canopy in it, um, then you can actually just eliminate that entire section from your ca calculations of your image. Um, and that will help you subtract out that um, sky part. Um, the next question uh, is, can the bacteria be carried through the fruit? Um, that's a great question. I actually personally don't know the answer to that question. I know that it's typically transmitted just through the, uh, the insects that carry it. Um, and they mostly feed on the leaves and the shoots, I believe. So um, that might be a question that you want to reach out directly to Dr. Vashish with um, if, you, if you would like to know more about that. The next question is uh, from Jack Engel. It is, does wind affect the readings? Um, and so uh, what I would say to this is that, yes, on a highly windy day, um, uh, there is potential that you're going to see very differing results. So if you have a very windy day, what you want to do is you want to just take more images, more samples of that single tree because you're going to have shifting, uh, uh, the canopy is going to be shifting on you. So you're going to want to make sure that you get as much of a representative sampling of that as possible. Um, the other option is just to kind of avoid, if you are in heavy wind conditions, maybe avoid uh, going out in the field to take measurement of that day. Um, but yes, uh, you, uh, there's, those are the two kind of mitigation strategies for addressing wind. Um, the next question from Marcus is, do you have to measure from underneath the tree or can you measure from above the canopy? It is a underneath the canopy instrument. Um, as uh, Bexa had mentioned, you don't have to take any above canopy reference measurements with the CI-110. Uh, you just simply need to take measurements from underneath. It is not, um, it is, since it has a self-leveling camera, it's on a, a leveling uh, a bezel, so you actually won't be able to physically get it to go upside down unless you were to kind of uh, tape it stable and then, and then turn it upside down. We don't really recommend doing that. Um, uh, there are a lot of other uh, technologies out there for doing above canopy, like drone technologies for looking at above canopy measurements that you could look into. And if you do have questions about drone technology, you can always um, reach out to our affiliate CID Ag Tech. Uh, the next question from Jesper is how much does the CI 110 cost in Europe, including delivery? So Jesper, uh, for that, I really, really recommend that you uh, fill out the uh, quote form in the tiny URL link so that you can get a specific cost uh, for uh, you, for your, that instrument, for um, um, uh, whatever location you are located in Europe. Um, the next question from Steve is, uh, please explain again why the CI-110 does not require an external or top of canopy measurement. Thanks. And I could explain this, but I feel like, uh, uh, Bekzad, uh, since you're still on the call here, uh, if you want to go ahead and explain, give your explanation again of uh, why uh, we don't uh, require the external or top of the canopy measurement. Um, it's really down to the type of technology that we utilize. Um, uh, as opposed to the Lycor instrument, but go ahead, Maxad. 
Yeah, the, the, you basically explained Galen, but, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, you're right. So LAI to um, 2000, or probably they have a newer model, 2200 right now. They utilize they utilize a light sensor, right, to to, uh, to estimate the, the um, LAI in a different canopies. Um, so that's why they need to take that we need to take first uh, above canopy measurement to see the uh, the uh, the unobstructed sky conditions. And then we need to take um, the, the below, below canopy readings to calculate, the, uh, to estimate the LEI. With, um, with uh, uh, SI-110, it, it's utilized a different uh, methodology. It's, uh, it's basically, it's high, high, hyperspectral camera, high resolution camera. Um, and uh, uh, the, the um, instrument util, um, utilizes uh, the, the photo taken, picture taken by the, by the, the by the camera and uh, analyze uh, and calculate LA. So it's different uh, method uh, techniques, te technology and methodology. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bexad. So yeah, so it's it's, it's just a, a different because we're using uh, actual image analysis as opposed to light sensing uh, technology. Um, that was why we are no, we do not require that top reference measurement. All right, the next question um, regarding, again, uh, wind. Uh, so this is using the CI-110 and trial plots, for example, winter wheat. Um, the wind blows the crop left and right. Should I take several measurements in the same spot? And how many for a trustworthy average? So yes, I would, I would recommend taking multiple measurements from the same spot. Um, and I would do it enough so that you just, I mean, there's no, I can't just give you a, a hard number uh, because it's going to depend on a lot of factors, but I would say that you want to at least take a few that represent, you know, when the wind's not blowing and when the wind is blowing and then average all that together to get your kind of average canopy uh, LAI uh, result. The next question from uh, Lionel is, is it possible to preset location GPS for sampling? Um, GPS, uh, I do not believe you can preset it. Uh, there might be a way to do that. I can, we can discuss that with our engineers. If that's a requirement for you, well, we might be able to figure something out uh, with one of our engineers here. Um, but I know that uh, the default for that is it, for it to just take the, it just acquires the GPS location wherever you take your scan, your image. Every time you press the trigger to take an image, it'll actually collect that GPS uh, data for you at that time. Um, the next question is, can it be triggered from a PC? Uh, I'm thinking if mounted on our phenomobile as we race through the plots. Um, so that is a very specific application. Uh, I, I believe that if that is something you wanted to do, I would uh, recommend you reach out directly to me and we can put you in touch with our engineers and we can see if that is something we can uh, do to get it hooked up to your phenomobile. And then our last question uh, here on the question and answer is, uh, what about smaller crops like potatoes or even smaller? Um, so the camera height, uh, you, what you're limited to essentially to measuring as far as height of canopies is the height of the actual camera on the end of the arm. So the height of the camera is uh, a couple inches tall. Um, and uh, so you can't measure anything that's shorter than um, I would say about three inches tall is the limit of uh, uh, as far as what you can measure. So if it doesn't have a canopy that's above three inches off the ground, uh, you're, you're not gonna be able to take an image of it unless you somehow dig <laughs> into the ground and then put the lens, a camera lens even lower. Um, so uh, it, that's the limit I typically recommend is about three inches or higher needs, the canopy needs to be. And I said that was the last question, but as I said that, there was a couple more questions that came rolling in. So um, another one is, um, if it doesn't require above canopy measurement as reference, then two below canopy measures under different conditions are comparable, such as different illuminations. So if you, for example, if you went to the same tree and you sat under the exact same spot, you set up the instrument under the same spot and you measured it in the morning when it was kind of overcast and in the afternoon when it was a very clear day, uh, then you might potentially get different uh, 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 actual, I guess, uh, 
readings from the instrument, LAI readings, um, because there might be uh, uh, some differences in how it differentiated. The way you overcome that uh, is just by using filters. And so there's a lot of built-in filters and there's also physical filters as I mentioned in order to allow, allow it to make sure that you have consistent differentiation. Um, but typically, uh, uh, if you have, if you use it under the same filter conditions, um, uh, you can get very comparable results, even if it is overcast versus sunny. Um, there are just some, some I have seen some examples of, of data where um, filters were needed to adjust for the very cloudy, darker kind of overcast days um, versus the bright, clear days. Um, but that's a very easy uh, fix. You can do either post-processing or when you go out to take the measurement. Um, pre-processing. But yes, the measurements will be comparable. Uh, the next question uh, is, how does the weather affect uh, the accuracy of the instrument? So it's, as we already mentioned, the sky conditions um, shouldn't affect the instrument, uh, the accuracy of the instrument. Um, the wind might have some effect. Uh, it is a fairly water resistant instrument, but please do not test that by going out in the middle of a monsoon and uh, test and using the instrument um, because that rain in the water will affect, uh, will damage and affect the, the um, uh, electronics if it's a downpour. Um, and also if you're getting water on the lens of the camera, then you're gonna have uh, distortion in your images as well. Uh, the next question is, uh, are there any demo videos teaching how to use the equipment or how to treat the images and the details to have a good measurement? Um, so as of now, I do believe there are there is a, a video, uh, at least a training video. I know that there are is a lot of good information in the manual, um, but if you do require some extra training to understand how to treat images and how to do that, um, then uh, you can also feel free to reach out to me directly and we can schedule a training session. And this question uh, is currently the last question. Um, uh, would an over canopy measurement on potatoes or something, a small crop I'm assuming is what you're, as you're inquiring about, uh, be better? Um, and so, if, yes, if it's so, if it's so small that you can't get the canopy imager underneath it, then uh, yeah, likely that you're, you're going to have better luck doing an over canopy measurement. And that is it for questions. It is exactly, oh, it's, it was exactly nine o'clock. It's 9.02 now, but thank you everyone so much for joining us. I hope you learned a lot about uh, the CI 110 imager. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Vashish for her uh, presentation on HLB and how they've utilized the CI-110 as a tool for assessment of treatments for HLB. And also thank you so much, Bexod, for your expertise on um, the comparison between the LICOR instrument uh, and the CI-110 uh, canopy imager and how you've mitigated the, uh, the issues that come along with greenhouse uh, structures. Uh, in order to successfully use the instrument. So thank you so much for joining us, taking the time to join us. Thank you everyone for, uh, for participating with us today. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.